Hello and welcome to Generation 16, the series that showcases the history of Sega's Mega Drive. I'm your host, Greg Seward. While other American publishers like Accolade and Razorsoft were simply dipping their toes in the Genesis waters in 1990, Electronic Arts dove in head first. In the space of seven months, it became the most prolific third-party publisher for the system worldwide, releasing seven games in total spanning a wide variety of styles such as football, basketball, golf, strategy, fighting, and shooting. With Sword of Sodan, EA was adding another important genre to its library, the belt-scrolling brawler. In Sword of Sodan, you take up the titular sword as siblings Shardan and Brodan, secret heirs to a throne vacated long ago when their father, King Pallas, was destroyed by the malevolent wizard, Zoras. The mighty warrior Sodan raised the siblings as his own, and now that he too has passed, it's time for the pair to finish what he started, destroy Zoras and restore peace to the world. You start your adventure on the outskirts of town, fighting your way past guards, giants, zombies, and more on your way to the castle and the final showdown with the evil wizard. Like so much of Electronic Arts' Genesis library to this point, Sword of Sodan is a port of a game that originally appeared on the Commodore Amiga, which isn't surprising considering founder and president Trip Hawkins backed the impressive computer very early on, not only supporting it with games, but with development tools. I wanted to make as many games for the Amiga as possible, and of course we had a lot of our own ideas for games. Uh, we even went back to our development tools, and our development tools were at that time PC based. And we had a really nice paint box program that our developers use on the PC to do the graphic art that went into the games. And, you know, Tim Mott uh, was a really brilliant guy that kind of ran the technology side of Electronic Arts for nine years. It was his idea that we take that paint box product and turn it into a consumer product, Deluxe Paint, which was uh, you know, the, easily the most popular you know, painting app in the mid 1980s. On, on any machine. Deluxe Paint would become the de facto graphic design tool for video games on the system, and really, video games in general for quite a while. It's not surprising that a game-centric software company like Electronic Arts would support the Amiga. This 16-bit wonder began life as a video game system when ex-Atari developer and Activision co-founder Larry Kaplan decided in 1982 that he wanted to work on a new console. With some financial backing, he quickly recruited Jay Miner, the genius behind the Atari 400 and 800 computers. Jay and Larry went to work creating the ultimate game machine through their company, Hi Toro. Then, the crash of 1983 happened. This is, of course, the season to be jolly, but the folks at Mattel and Warner Communications and a lot of other companies are having trouble getting into the holiday spirit. Sales down dramatically for home video game cartridges and investors are bailing out. Suddenly, no one wanted anything to do with video games. The fad was over. Introducing a new games console at this point would have been retail suicide. But due to personal computers having been positioned as productivity devices, even though they too played video games, computer hardware sales were still relatively strong. It was at this point that Jay Miner proposed turning their fledgling game console into a low-end home computer. And thus, the Amiga 1000 was born in 1985. While Commodore, who now owned Amiga, certainly marketed the 1000 as a productivity machine, beneath that business-like exterior was the soul of a game console. It had a 16-bit processor, a color palette magnitudes bigger than that found on a Commodore 64 or NES, a staggering 256K of memory, and a sound system that was light years ahead of anything else before it. 
It retailed at a relatively low price for that amount of power, especially when the budget Amiga 500 hit in 1987 for $699. Naturally, Electronic Arts wasn't alone in supporting this beast, with names like Cinemaware, Team 17, The Bitmap Brothers, DMA Design, Sensible Software, Bullfrog, Lucasfilm Games, Delphine Software, and more, all getting behind the Amiga. All this insane horsepower wasn't astronomically out of reach for your average middle-class enthusiast, of which there were many in the UK and Europe, thanks to the popularity of the Commodore 64, Sinclair Spectrum, and other microcomputers. While North Americans and Japanese gamers were playing their Famicoms and Nintendo Entertainment Systems, there was a booming cottage industry of bedroom coders who cut their teeth on these cheap 8-bit computers, learning that they could make a living by making games. In addition, there was a whole generation of players who got used to copying and trading those games at copy parties. But first those games had to be cracked so that they could be copied. The teams who were cracking these games tended to sign their work, usually with some kind of intro screen. It was very normal to see a completely unrelated screen upon boot up of a pirated game that showed you the name of the team that cracked the software, usually along with messages either shouting out or calling out similar groups, or maybe just bragging about their own personal skills. In Germany, uh, piracy, um, software piracy was rampant, absolutely rampant. Um, and I don't know why, but it's quite the phenomenon um, that um, Germans and I believe Scandinavians tend to not want to buy software. <laughs> and I never understood why. So that means um, I got into, into pirated games uh, pretty, pretty big time. The people who were a bit more clever not only pirated games, but they also programmed delicious graphical uh, and sound intros. It was seeing one of these impressive intros that piqued the interest of a young Scandinavian student named Soren Granbeck. He had taught himself to code after deciding he absolutely needed to understand how seemingly random noise on an audio cassette somehow translated into a playable game for his Commodore 64. Like most Commodore 64 players, Soren had played his share of copy games. Some of the games that we had included a message from a cracker. This cracker was PMK from Danish Crackers, and the slogan they used was They make him, we break him. This little message would show up just before that game started, and had something called a scroll line. A scroll line? Now that was cool. Soon those displays of skill and artistry that first appeared on cracked game intros evolved into what became known as the demo scene. Competition between these coders, which was mostly friendly, drove them to push the hardware more and more as time went on, each coder striving for a chance to show off their work at demo scene parties and feel the awe and adulation of their peers. One of the names that appeared regularly was Sodan, a portmanteau of Soren Grombeck's first name and his home country, Denmark. But Soren wasn't just a demo creator. He made video games as well. He eventually found his way to Danish game maker Kelleline, working on a game called The Vikings alongside Martin Peterson, the mind behind Battle Squadron, a previous Amiga to Genesis release from Enterprise. And while Kelleline didn't last much longer after The Vikings, the crew of young Danish coders and artists stuck together and founded another company, Starvision. It was around this time that Soren set his sights on the Amiga, which with its incredible horsepower was like candy to those involved in the demo scene. Soren was about to make his mark on the platform. The first demo I remember is at no surprise the Sodan demo, which kind of showed a lot of Amiga features like dual playfield and, and everything that was going on in that demo and drawing lines, 3D graphics. And it, it kind of blew me away that you could do it because I hadn't got that far at that point and it, it just got me even more interested and wanted to learn more about the Amiga chipset so I could do those things as well. Tech Tech was the product of Gronbeck taking a breather from work on what would become Sort of Sodan, throwing together several pieces of code that he had been working on with co-developer Julian Le Fay. It was the first of what would be coined Mega Demos. You can see an example of the multi-scrapper screen scroller used in Sort of Sodan's title screen at the beginning of the Tech Tech demo. After releasing Mach on the Commodore 64, StarVision wanted to release something on the Amiga, and the crew decided it would be a fighting game. But the sprites on the Amiga were small. Most people were used to small sprites and objects moving. 
Historically, that was what was possible, since a full moving background with some objects on top was the max that the Amiga could move in one frame. So we were stuck for some days, until I suddenly realized that we were not going to animate a soldier with 50 frames per second, but maybe 5 frames per second. Meaning that there could be 10 times as much stuff going on as we initially thought. So now I asked Torben to draw graphics as big as possible, and Sword of Sodan was in the making. Unfortunately, StarVision ran out of money and was shuttered before Sword of Sodan could be released. In the aftermath, Soren, Julian, and Torben decided to attend a hacker party in Switzerland, where they showed off the unfinished game to rapturous applause. I imagine a room full of hackers would have been amazed to see characters that almost filled the screen moving around and fighting each other. It was here that Rick Ross approached the group about coming to America to finish the game for Discovery Software International. A year later, Discovery released Sword of Sodan on the Amiga to quite positive reviews. Amiga Computing praised the graphics and special effects. Amiga User International called it the closest thing to a state-of-the-art coin-op game on the system. Commodore User cited the amazing sound effects in the way that they set the atmosphere perfectly for the sword-swinging action. After picking either Shardan or Brodan, they both play the same, you find yourself outside the city walls with a couple of pike-carrying guards blocking your way. The sheer size of the on-screen characters is astounding the first time you see it, especially compared to almost anything else on the market at the time. Gameplay is very straightforward. Your hero can only face to the right of the screen, and can only perform around three different types of swings with their sword. It's clear almost from the start that every encounter in Sword of Sodan is meant to be eventful. For all the comparisons to arcade-style hack-and-slash games, Sodan feels like it takes its fighting cues from something more along the lines of Street Fighter or Karataka. This is further driven home as you progress through each new level, which are all relatively short and generally only feature one or two major encounters with enemies or traps. You don't have to rely on your sword alone to make it to the final showdown with Zoras. Sword of Sodan features power-ups in the form of potions, which are randomly dropped by enemies as they're defeated. Potions can do anything from kill your opponent immediately, to wrapping you in a temporary shield, to giving you an extra life. In Sword of Sodan, you need all the help you can get, because this game is brutally tough at first. What enemies lack in technique, they make up for in relentless onslaught. As you get further into the game, the addition of surprise, one-hit traps can get really frustrating. Sword of Sodan was a visual masterpiece and hung around the top of the Amiga sales charts for the better part of six months, reportedly selling over 55,000 copies and winning 1988's Arcade Game of the Year from Commodore Computing International. The reception wasn't quite so rosy, though, when the game was re-released a few years later as a budget title. Reviewers lambasted Sword of Sodan in 1993. Amiga Format awarded it a score of 52%, saying it's all a bit of a mess, it looks nice, but plays poorly. Amiga Power called the game tedious and scored it 29%. The One magazine said it was one of the lamest excuses for a horizontally scrolling slash -em up the reviewer had ever had the misfortune to endure before awarding it a paltry 34%. So what happened? I'm not really sure. All I can think of is that Sword of Sodan is a classic case of flash over substance. Upon speaking to a few friends who lived the Amiga lifestyle back in the late 80s, the best I can guess is that, similar to what we see during new console launches, sometimes games that can show off what a system can do get a bit of a pass when it comes to their gameplay shortcomings. Large swaths of the gaming public in the UK and Europe were coming off hardware like the Sinclair Spectrum and Commodore 64 when they switched to the Amiga. Remember, the console market in these regions wasn't nearly the same as in North America, where the NES had become the norm. Anything that proved the Amiga could bring arcade visuals home was perhaps treated a bit gently in the press. In retrospect, when you think about the demo scene, which all members of the Sodan team were ensconced in, it's not surprising that gameplay takes a bit of a backseat to a level of presentation that shows off the technical prowess of the developers. Looking back at reviews of the Vikings, done by largely the same team, the criticisms are similar. A few very flashy, technically impressive bits with gameplay that's okay, but not with much depth or balance. 
Since the first year Electronic Arts began releasing Genesis games, their focus seemed to be bringing over a variety of Amiga games to share shelf space with their sports games and represent a bunch of popular genres on the console. With this goal in mind, it makes sense that the medieval hack and slash action of Sword of Sodan made the cut. Sega's own arcade hit Golden Axe had come to the Genesis only a year earlier to solid reviews. Electronic Arts and Enterprise tasked a single man, Anselm Hook, to port the game to the Genesis over about three and a half months. Even with that ridiculously short time frame though, he recognized that the game in its original form might not be the best fit for the console. We wanted to just amp it up. It's like one of the things about these games is that we didn't have a lot of oversight, right? There wasn't a lot, mainly there wasn't a lot of beta test and a lot of kind of balancing. So I, I felt like I wanted a lighter, faster mechanic where there was more button mashing. And uh, so both of those ideas, more enemies at once, more hacking, a little bit higher speed game and, and some additional power ups came out of that idea of that the audiences were different for those platforms. The differences are immediately apparent from the second you start the game. The visuals aren't quite as nice, with fewer colors and slightly smaller characters, though still quite big for a Genesis game. Where there were only a few guards at the city gate on the Amiga, the Genesis version greets you with what feels like a whole battalion. Unlike in the Amiga game, they come at you from both sides of the screen, so while their arsenal of sword attacks remains the same on the console version, Brodan and Chardan can now turn and face in either direction. For some odd reason though, turning around requires holding the jump button and tapping the D-pad left or right. I think it might have something to do with maintaining the intended fighting style, but it feels really clunky and takes a lot of getting used to. Well, I think of these platforms as creative exploration platforms, and I, and I, I kind of, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to honor Soren's work. I don't know that I exactly did. It's a, it's a different game in, in some ways. Most encounters on the Amiga required retreating at the right time to avoid enemy attacks and then advancing on adversaries when there was an opening to land a strike. The Genesis game replicates this pretty well, although with the slow turn rate and the frankly overwhelming number of enemies on screen at various times, it can get seriously frustrating. Just as in the original game, the potion system balances this out a bit. On the Amiga, your heroes could gather potions which could grant extra lives, increase attack strength, kill the nearest enemy instantly, or temporarily shield Shardan and Brodan from damage. The system was massively expanded on the Genesis. The mechanic was intended to make it simpler for the Sega Genesis because it, it was a lighter, faster, different audience. I wanted a mechanic that was quicker. It was a lot of work to play the game, and I wanted to let people kind of, you know, get through the game more quickly. While drinking single potions on the Genesis could still increase your sword power or kill a nearby enemy, or heal you, the real power lie in using them to create new concoctions. By tapping start and choosing multiple potions from your inventory, you could gain an extra life, set your sword on fire, get a shield, or even skip an entire level. But you can't just mix and match with impunity. The wrong combination could poison you. Drinking every color at once even kills you, with a cheeky message about winners not doing drugs flashing up on the screen. The new potion system really does add a welcome layer of depth to Sword of Sodan. By managing your inventory and drinking the right mix at the right time, you can strategize your way almost completely through the entire game. Which is a blessing, because enemy attacks are so relentless. Like Battle Squadron, the previous game from Enterprise, Sword of Sodan is in desperate need of some play balancing. First of all, there's a technical engineering challenge. Can you do it all with new hardware? Can, can you move fast enough to hit the Christmas market? For small companies, hitting that market is do or die. Okay, so shipping is more important than quality. Um, and then secondly, the, the, next, the next challenge was uh, product review. We didn't actually have any product review. The goal was to ship. And so, you know, there, there wasn't a, normally when I do a larger production these days, there's, you know, there's a whole team of beta testers and, and also kind of a quality, um, you know, people looking at the gameplay, thinking about it, balancing the game, making sure it's not too easy, not too hard, making sure there's no cheats. All those things were missing. 
I kind of I kind of was beta test. I, I I was designer. I did a lot of the work. I built the art tools. Torben did the art. I've got a reputation for whatever it's going to take. We're going to ship this thing, no matter what. We're not going to if we don't have this. If we can't sleep, whatever. We're going to ship. Failure is not an option. And that was the case here. We we shipped, but we did cut corners, and that's there's a there's a cost to that. And it, and it, sometimes I wonder. Is that cost worth paying? When you think about it in that context, the rush to learn the hardware with no documentation and get something out for Christmas, it's actually pretty surprising how different sort of Sodan is on the Genesis compared to the Amiga original. You have to give Anselm credit for trying to appeal to what he saw as the system's audience while doing all this work himself, rather than just bashing together a straight port. That doesn't mean it's worth playing though. Sort of Sodan is difficult for all the wrong reasons. The Genesis version took what was already an extremely uneven challenge and ratcheted it up to insane levels. Take this level where you have to fight a host of giants. Not only do they have better reach than your hero, but just hacking their life bar down to zero isn't enough. When they're brought to their knees, you have to hack their heads off to finish them, or else they'll just get back up and keep fighting. I mean, that sounds pretty cool in practice, but due to Sodan's less than stellar hit detection, you actually have to back up and position yourself very precisely to behead your enemies within that small window of time. Something that's made all the more difficult if you've got another giant simultaneously thrashing away from another direction. Or, as you probably noticed in this footage, a series of completely hidden pit traps to contend with. Actually, I have to give Anselm some credit here. The pit traps on the Genesis version are given away by a slight discoloration on the floor, something not found in the original Amiga game, as far as I can tell. But there are more of them, and the level is longer, and there are far more enemies to fight in this hallway. Here's another example of this crazy difficulty. Deep within the castle, these flying enemies swarm you. In the original game, there were a handful of these things, on the Genesis, they seem endless. Again, thanks to the imprecise hit detection, they overwhelm your hero quickly. And this becomes a frustrating battle of attrition where you march back and forth, swinging wildly, praying to hit something as your on-screen avatar is almost obscured from view by all the annoying little monsters. Game reviews for the Genesis version were a mixed bag. GamePro was actually pretty kind, clearly dazzled by the large characters and gore, Funnily enough, most UK and Euro magazines were harder on the game, most likely because they remembered playing it on the Amiga a few years earlier, as this Sega Power reviewer points out. Those of us who didn't play it back then were probably still aware of Sword of Sodan. It had beautiful cover art painted by Dorian Vallejo, son of the famous Boris Vallejo, and looked amazing in screenshots. Golden Axe was still fresh in the memory of lots of gamers, and let's face it, Barbarians were just popular in the 80s and early 90s. They've really been a staple of video games for years. Sort of Sodan was influential, even if it wasn't necessarily for all the right reasons. So much so that it very nearly made the cut when Sega was putting together its Genesis mini console in 2019, according to Sega's chief content officer, Hiroyuki Miyazaki. It's not said to be a masterpiece, but we wanted to include this because in some ways it's one of the games that symbolizes the Mega Drive era. Ultimately, Miyazaki said the game was cut because it would have resulted in the console receiving an M rating. Co-op creator Bennett Foddy cited the game as a guiding light in a 2013 interview when discussing how frustrating players is integral to good game design. But it has to be done right. Sort of Sodan, in his opinion, got it wrong. You're walking along, suddenly this thing comes out of the ground and kills you. The only way around it is to play it 100 times to memorize the position of the hazards, and that's not much fun. I think that what we have here is a clash of development philosophies. While console games were starting to offer longer, more intricate and balanced experiences, Sword of Sodan was the product of a different gaming ecosystem where balance and longevity took a backseat to technical prowess and having a showpiece for your fancy new Amiga. Did that philosophy translate to the Genesis in 1990? Probably not. But it's clear that this was the angle from which the game was ported to the console. 
The pressure wasn't per se on a high quality experience specifically. The pressure was to ship a game in three months from scratch on new hardware that they'd never developed for. And that'll do it for this episode of Generation 16. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed what you saw, please like and subscribe, and leave comments below to feed the algorithm. Join me next time as we take a look at the final Mega LD launch game for the Pioneer Laser Active. See you then!